This assessment task in complex numbers covered a lot of different concepts and skills. And so we're gonna go through these questions one at a time quickly if we can, uh, but we'll also where appropriate have a look at the multiple strategies or different approaches to each of the questions because sometimes there are many different ways to solve each question. Though I will stop along the way and try and point out where I think one solution uh, might be more elegant than another. So here's the first question in multiple choice. It shows an argand diagram and then you've got this number z that's placed on it, but you don't know very much about z, so it might seem like it'd be quite hard to work out if that's z, where is, as the question asks, z squared on the modulus of z. Now, um, I will show you kind of like a, an algebraic way to kind of handle what's going on here, but before we get to that, I think it's more helpful to think just in geometric terms, right? What do we know about Z? Well, we don't know um, how far away it is from the origin. You've got this dotted line circle here, but you know, you don't get given a radius for that. What you do know though, is this argument, because if you have a think about how far you need to rotate around from the positive real axis to get to Z, um, that pretty clearly looks like, I mean, I'm only doing this approximately, but that's three quarters of the way to a straight angle, right? So that's three quarters of pi. Now, when you are multiplying a complex number by itself, what happens is, because you're adding arguments and multiplying uh, moduli, what happens is um, you are going to get further or closer away depending on uh, what the radius of that circle is. But more importantly for our purposes here, you're going to rotate. And because you've got an argument here of three pi on four, we know that we're going to um, add those arguments together. So you get three pi on four plus three pi on four, which is going to be three pi on two. It's not a principal argument, but I don't need it to be a principal argument to be able to tell A, B, C, and D, which is the most plausible option. You can see down here, um, B is going to be the best option because the argument to B, you can see three pi on two rotating around like so. So clearly, even without going any further into A, B, C, and D as the different options, B is clearly the best one. I will point out if you want to do this again in a more uh, sort of uh, algebraic way, um, I can just define z to be some uh, some complex number with an unknown modulus, because remember, I don't know how big this circle is, um, but I know that the argument has to be about 3 pi and 4, because you can see where it sits on the complex plane. So when I go through and I square it, this is what I get on the numerator, the modulus of z, if we use this re to the i theta notation, the modulus of z is just r. So you can see that's why I'm dividing through r squared by r, leaves me with one r. If you come back to the diagram, that's why your options a, b, c, and d, they're all on um, the circumference of that original circle. And that three pi on two I got from doubling um, this angle over here. All right, so then question two, which complex number is a sixth root of i? Now you can see over here, um, I've gotten an answer of a, but before you get to that answer, you can actually very rapidly exclude some of the answers that are nonsensical. Um, for instance, the sixth root of i, right? So this is some number, um, let's call it say w, and when I um, raise it to the sixth power, um, I should get i. Now, as we noted before, when you multiply complex numbers by each other, um, there's going to be rotation, but there's also gonna be scaling, right? Now, if you have a number that is uh, further away from the origin, then as you multiply it, it scales up further and further and further. And so since I know that i is actually on the unit circle, that tells me that these two options here, c and d, are immediately irrelevant because uh, you know root 2 is about 1.4 so this is negative 1.4 plus 1.4i so where would that be on an argand diagram if I were to draw a very rough argand diagram here and put uh, let's put a unit circle on here because oh that's an, <laughs> an ellipse that's not what I wanted uh, let's draw something a little more circular so it recognizes that's better so if we place i here, where would negative 1.4 plus 1.4i, where would that sit? Uh, 1.4 is about that far and that far. So I'm guessing it'll be somewhere up here. Now it's clearly too far away. When you multiply that even by itself once, right? You're already away from the unit circle. You're just gonna get further and further away. So that's why I've eliminated options C and D. And then to work out out of options A and B, which one is better, um, again, I think about the arguments. That's the key difference between them minus one on root two plus one on root two i has the same modulus as minus one on root two minus one on root two i because um, they just sit in different quadrants. So that's why you can see um, over here, I'm really focusing on the angle. Three pi and four, if you raise it to the sixth power, you're just multiplying that index by six. So 18 pi on four becomes nine pi on two. Um, nine pi on two is an enormous argument. So I'm subtracting um, integer multiples of two pi because that's full revolution. So this is 
two full revolutions. That brings you back to pi on two. That's i, which is what I wanted after all. So that's how I know the answer is a. And then here comes the last multiple choice question. So here's this curve um, on the argand diagram below. Which equation defines this curve? Well, we know it's going to between, be between um, this point over here, four, and this point over here, minus 2i. So therefore, um, remembering the form of all different minor and major arcs, we need something that's of the form, stay on red I guess, uh, z minus 4, and also this is z minus negative 2i. So that would be z plus 2i. So when you have a look, you can see, again, I can remove some options fairly quickly um, because you've got these z minus 2i options over here, c, and D. Um, and then you can see, oh, Z minus four. Well, this is the case in both of them. So now I have to choose between A and B. Uh, what's the difference between A and B? Well, you've got the Z minus four is the same. The Z plus two I's the same. The pi on three is the same for all of them. The difference is, where's your start point? Where's your end point? So you can see, I need to count uh, or measure my angles anti-clockwise from a start point to an end point. So um, is it anti-clockwise to go in this direction or is it anti-clockwise to go in this direction? And if you think carefully about the direction that a clock goes in, uh, it's clearly going to be the blue direction, right? So therefore, get rid of these red arrows. So I have to start from minus 2i, then I've got to go to 4, uh, and that's why you can see I've written anti-clockwise from negative 2i to 4, um, and that's option B. So that's all the multiple choice questions. Let's now dive into the extended response. 4a starts with uh, some warm-up stuff here to be honest, um, just some simple straightforward complex number arithmetic. So um, we define for you a particular z and a particular w, how do we square it? Well I won't go into too much detail on this one because I think you'll be okay handling it. Um, you can see all I've done here is this is just 7 plus 11i and I've just expanded the brackets uh, when I square it. So there's my 7 squared, there's my 11i squared, noting that the i squared has become a negative 1. And this is double the product of these two. So 77i is the product of these two. You double that, you get 154i. Don't forget that. Uh, your complex numbers do have imaginary parts. So this is what you get for z squared. When you have a look at part two, you can see in my working, I've done this kind of in two parts. Firstly, I've said, oh, you want z take away w. So that's what I started working out over here. So this is just my straight substitution. And then I've collected like terms, real and imaginary parts. But then secondly, I noticed the question is also asking for the conjugate of z minus w. So that's me taking the imaginary part and just flipping the sign. So that's part two. And then lastly for part three, you can see here is my division. So uh, there's z, there's w, and what I've multiplied through by is the conjugate of w because that gives me this uh, completing, sorry, not completing, this uh, difference of squares down the bottom. That's just going to be completely real. So you get this 34 down there and that eventually cancels out with what uh, neatly you have on the numerator there, which gives you one minus two i as a final solution. Okay, part B. Now, um, you have to be careful with this one, right? Because I think most of us were okay to just start off, as you can see, here's my answer here, um, that you're multiplying out uh, on the left-hand side, you're expanding these brackets, and you're then saying, oh, well, once I expand it, I'll get some real bits, I'll get some imaginary bits, and then I'm going to equate them with what I have over here on the right-hand side. So you can see I've already done that here in my working. Here's the first line of expansion, and then what I've done is I have said, this is real, uh, and this is real, so I've collected them over here. And then this term, or these, this pair of terms rather, is imaginary, so I've factorized out the i, and there's my imaginary part there. So red part's gonna be six, blue part's going to be seven, so you'd get that, and you've got um, a pair of simultaneous equations which you can then solve, like you have solved many simultaneous equations in the past. And then you get to this point, uh, maybe you solved for uh, A instead of for B, it doesn't really matter, you can go in either order. But whichever order you go in, you should notice that when you get to this factorization, um, as you would normally expect from a quadratic equation like, uh, like this one, right, um, you get a pair of solutions. But you have to read the question really carefully, and this is going to come back as a theme again and again. Um, you know, our brains go so quickly into, oh, I'm doing stuff. I've got an algorithm in my head that I'm really good at. But the question may actually have told you additional information that you needed to be able to fine tune or tweak your algorithm accordingly. So at this point, your algorithm normally tells you two solutions, B equals this, B equals that. But 
The first line of the question says A and B are integers. So this tells you when you get to this point in the factorization just over here, one of these solutions is not valid because B has to be an integer. So you just get a single value for B and that gives you a single value for A. So watch out for that one.